What a fucked up world we live in. <laughs> in our backyard, only a few hours ago, four people were executed in Indonesia, uh, and they promised to keep doing, uh, keeping keeping that up, despite global protests. And since last month, the madman president of the Philippines, who called upon uh, police to kill drug users. In one month, 300 people have been killed by police and vigilantes. We're not here uh, to solve those problems, but uh, they are problems in our backyard. Um, and it, it just they just go to highlight the inhumanity of uh, of 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 some of the ways that people try to deal with the with the uh, their drug problems. Uh, welcome uh, to our first speaker and soup series for for this winter. Uh, I'm Ross Bell. I'm the executive director of the New Zealand Drug Foundation, who hosts these things. What I like about these sessions is that they always attract uh, a diverse audience. Uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome such a, a, a room full of people. We always get new people, always get different people, uh, depending on the topic. It's always good for us to be able to engage uh, with um, with new audiences on some of the tricky topics uh, that we're all trying to um, trying to deal with. Um, we've got some of New Zealand's uh, in the room today. Some of New Zealand's biggest gangs. Um, We've got the mongrel mob, New Zealand Defence Force are here, and police are here. Uh, we love the New Zealand's new uh, national drug policy. Uh, if you haven't read it, uh, you should. In the very first paragraph of the drug policy, it says that New Zealand's alcohol and other drug problems are first and foremost health issues. And we agree. But what is the implication of that? If you're saying that these are first and foremost health issues, surely first and foremost we should be dealing with these through a health uh, and a social service lens. They demand health responses. So the purpose of these uh, lunchtime series this year is to unpick some of that. You know, what does a public health approach to drugs look like? If that's government policy, what should that mean in practice? And so over the next few months, we're wanting to, to delve a bit digger. What are some of the practical implications for that? How can we provide interventions that are first and foremost health and social service um, interventions? Uh, today, we're going to be looking at the very interesting topic of methamphetamine. Um, but please do come along to our, our next two sessions. Next month, we're looking at new and creative ways of doing harm reduction. You know, what are, what are some of the, we've done needle exchange well in New Zealand, what are some of the other things we should be doing uh, to, to, to open the doors more widely to, to health interventions to people who, who use drugs? Uh, and in a month after that, we're going to be looking at how law enforcement can be applying public health approaches to their work. Methamphetamine, we're in a bit of a quandary. Government data tells us that methamphetamine use has more than halved in New Zealand in the last four years. But only a few weeks ago, we saw half a tonne of meth wash up on a beach in Northland. And other record seizures have been made. Uh, a friend of ours, um, has said that New Zealand is facing its second methamphetamine epidemic. Another friend of ours in the treatment sector says that methamphetamine is now the number one presentation uh, and they have waiting lists uh, for their residential treatment services. Treatment sector says technology. <laughs> There's waiting lists for people to get help. Housing New Zealand has spent, in one year, over $20 million cleaning up meth-contaminated houses. 
20 million dollars that's about a fifth of our of our treatment budget now i'm not going to jump on my hobby horse about the the, the bullshit um to, to to what housing new zealand is doing falling for the for the lies that the testing industry is is, is telling the country <coughs> So we're told that meth is making a comeback in provincial New Zealand. Now, provincial New Zealand are parts of the country that don't have access to the kind of treatment services you'll get uh, in big cities. So what do we do if, that's, if this is the case, if provincial New Zealand is seeing meth problems, what are we gonna do to, to, to intervene? We've also thought that meth for a long time has been a drug for adults. The typical using age for meth is in the people in their 30s, but we're beginning to hear now that younger New Zealanders are using meth. And that has implications. Are treatment services set up to cater for youth uh, users? And all of this contrasts with the government narrative, and it's a narrative that I've agreed with actually, that you know, use is coming down, it went up, it went up in the late 90s. Throughout the 2000s, New Zealand was one of the highest users of methamphetamine um, in the world. What do we do during that period of time when meth went like this and sort of plateaued at very high levels? Well, the first thing we did, the first intervention for meth, we made it a class A drug. Problem solved. That didn't, that didn't seem to fix the problem. It certainly clogged up the high court because it was a life sentence. You had to do it in the high court. They now let um, meth cases be heard in, in district court. So we made it a class A drug. Remember that? Remember all the clan lab busts? <coughs> Fire men and all of their silver outfits and, and things. There were lots of those. Clan lab explosions. Remember being denied access to decent flu tablets? You know, we took we took pseudoephedrine. We took pseudoephedrine. What was meth doing? <coughs> da, 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 tracking up. Remember Anthony Dixon. Despite those things, New Zealand remained one of the highest users of meth in the world. Then the Prime Minister, the new Prime Minister comes along with a methamphetamine action plan. And in that plan, there were lots of different responses, but one of the new things was to put more money into treatment and to signpost more people to help. And what happened? Well, meth use more than half. So I don't know what that tells you. What I say it tells us is that we were able to reduce meth use by treating it first and foremost as a health issue. We put money into help and help seeking, I don't know if, you, if you agree with that narrative or not. But anyway, we have two people here today to help us unpick some of this tricky tricky narrative is the government's narrative right or, or or has that no longer now kept up with this new thing uh, that is happening let's find out the first we've got two people to help us out matt Knofs, all the way from australia uh, chief executive of the youth treatment and social service provider the Knofs foundation and detective superintendent virginia labar who is director of the organized and financial crime agency uh, I'll first welcome Matt. Uh, Matt runs the Knofs Foundation, which was uh, established in 19, 1970. You can see what happens here. This is a perfect sort of job creation thing. You, you work for your family. So the Knofs Foundation, his name is Matt Knofs, was created by his grandparents in 19, uh, 1970, uh, the Reverend Ted Knofs and Margaret. And they were pioneers in youth treatment and harm reduction in Australia. Uh, they handed the, the baton of that work to Matt's parents, Wesley and Mandy, who continued, um, continued that work until handing it to, to Matt and his partner, Naomi. The NOS Foundation is a real leading, shining light in Australia for youth services. They provide treatment. But they, they also, as much as possible, open their doors to young people who have a whole lot of challenges, very low threshold entry um, into the kind of innovative services that, that the, the NOS Foundation does, job creation things. There's a whole lot of stuff that I'm hoping Matt will be able to touch on today. Um, so 
please um, join me in welcoming Matt. Thanks, Ross, and thanks to the New Zealand Drug Foundation for having me today. Um, I love how much you guys swear. It's unbelievable. <laughs> it's so, so progressive. It was just Ross, is it? Okay, all right. Um, no, we did a thing on The Nation TV, like, was it last week or week before? And um, one of the political leaders, like, tweeted afterwards something and, and, and shit was in the tweet. <laughs> and I was just like, oh, I'm moving to New Zealand. That's it. <laughs> we, um, we've got a lot to learn um, from you guys. And... Uh, I've been writing about that uh, in the book that's out there, Breaking the Ice, which um, goes into detail about why, and, and you guys are kind of at the end there and I talk with Ross about that and briefly kind of goes over what he just discussed, what New Zealand has done, which is so forward thinking, not just with ice, um, but also with, um, despite its pause at the moment, the, the what do you call it, the psychoactive substances bill and the, and the, 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 the trialling of, of regulating things that, uh, were previously uncontrollable. So um, uh, you did a decent job in describing uh, our organisation. It, it's always interesting, though, um, coming into a, a new uh, territory. Uh, we've just started new services in Queensland and we don't have the same kind of... People don't know who we are as much in Queensland as they do in Sydney. I can walk into a shopping centre and, and buy something and scan a credit card and I'll say, oh, no, it's not related to Ted, who was my grandfather. Yeah, he married me and it was amazing. I mean, my grandfather married so many people, buried so many kids from heroin overdoses, had christened so many babies. And one of the things that made Ted so special was, um, well, he did a number of different things. He started Lifeline, which is one of our biggest um, organisations. He co-founded that. He walked away from it because the co-founder, who was an, another minister at the time, said, the rule is, is before someone accepts help, they have to submit their soul to Christ. And my grandfather said, who was a, min a young minister as well, he said, no, I'm not going to have a bar of that and walked away. But he worked with a guy called Charlie Perkins and they did the Freedom Rides uh, in in the uh, late uh, early 60s, late 50s, early 60s. And at the time, our law said in the late 50s that our Aboriginal people were animals. That's what the law said. They were fauna. And so my grandfather and Ted started the Freedom Rides and they then turned that. They, they were able to challenge the law, change it, Aboriginal people... At first, men got the right to vote and were considered to be human beings, but they then went on to start the Department of Aboriginal Affairs. Then Ted started a little chapel in, in King's Cross in Australia, um, which was a, continues to be a kind of rough, interesting neighbourhood with um, uh, sex parlours and pubs and everything. Um, and, and he started this place. And uh, one of the things... I think besides all these things, what, what made Ted really interesting was um, when I was eight years old, this is how I got into all of this, I was about seven or eight years old, he would actually walk me around King's Cross and introduce me to Sarah the prostitute. He'd introduced me to Paul, who was the, the local drug dealer. He'd introduced me to Barry, who was a politician. The media would come and interview him, and I'd stand there and watching him. Prince Charles once came up and introduced me to Prince Charles when he was over. And I had, so my view of the world was, was oh, this is, this is normal. Um, and I've grown up, you know, and a lot of people kind of say to me, you don't have a, the, uh, you've got a strange view of the world. But that was my grandfather's view of the world. He had a saying which still resonates with a lot of us in Australia and it goes like this. It's still controversial today. You tell me what you think. He used to say, I am a Catholic, but I'm also a Protestant. I'm a Jew, but I'm also a Muslim. I'm a Hindu, but I'm also a Sikh. I'm an agnostic, but I'm also an atheist. Because first and foremost, I am a human being and no one in this world is a stranger to me. <coughs> and he called that the creed of the family of humanity. And one of the interesting things is it's just such a rare quality today to not perceive someone else as the other, but to say they are a member of our family. And so seeing the drug crisis with heroin escalate, what he said watching it from the 70s into the 80s, watching like a, a horror movie in slow motion. 
he realised that people who were suffering from drug dependence were not the other. They were a member of that family and, and needed to be considered as a human being first and foremost. And so from the very beginning, he, he would walk into Premier's office, very famously walked into the New South Wales Premier's office and slammed down a bag of syringes and said, what are you going to do about it? Um, and in the beginning, we'd talk about the war on drugs. Um, and, he, and he passed away when I was, he had a stroke when, when I was um, um, eight or nine. Uh, left him as a vegetable for another six years before he passed away. But um, by the time my my parents then were were were, were thrust into the position of of continuing that, the church who had been who charged him three times with heresy for saying what I just told you <laughs> three times. He was on the front of the paper as a heretic. Uh, of course, what the church wasn't expecting that everyone rallied behind him, and it was the beginning of the end of the the, the church really in Australia. But um, my parents went with what was left over after the church had taken everything else, went and started the country's first rehabilitation for adolescents. There was, well, there was nothing before that for adolescents. Um, and then um, I started these things called the Street University with my wife. It wasn't my wife at the time. She was working with asylum seekers in Western Sydney and we started this experiment. I wanted to go back to try doing what my grandfather was doing. We called them the Street Universities. And we had uh, 3,000 young people turn up in the first year, not coming to be, uh, you know, I remember one kid saying to me, you're religious? And I'm like, no, you're a cop. No, what the fuck are you then? <laughs> um, oh, I'm a youth worker. Um, not so exciting. But um, the young people would come and get involved with, with graffiti and with hip hop and all these things. And suddenly you had thousands of young people coming there and then we could sit down and talk about their drug issues and everything else was going on. But on their level, coming from the point of view that we weren't there to necessarily teach them anything, we had something to learn as well in that process. And very quickly we saw crime drop in that community uh, vandalism, especially around things like graffiti and the governments and the local governments came to us saying, we really believe you've uh, contributed a lot to the significant decrease in that. And so now there are seven of those around the country. But a part of that process for me um, over the last five years has been talking about drug law <coughs> and challenging that. Um, and and, and interesting, the first time that New Zealand played a, 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 a key role in that for me was when I was here during that very brief episode during that time when you guys went to regulate uh, synthetic drugs. And I was here, I was in Auckland, and I was there in a room, and it was when I was in a room with police, people who were previously uh, illegal dealers, now retailers and, you know, uh, uh, approved uh, manufacturers, everyone in the room together and users, that the penny dropped for me. And I realised why our laws had been so wrong. When I'd heard police talk about why this was so much better for them, when I'd heard politicians talk about it. And even though, um, you know, things, uh, you know, from you might look at it from a different point of view, but pause for the time being, I realised... This was absolutely the way that the rest of the world had to go. And um, and I even thought about it for my two kids as well. I thought, I don't know if I like the idea of them using substance, illicit, currently illicit substances one day. But I remember my wife saying to me, well, what would you prefer? If they're going to use something, would you prefer them getting it from a dealer outside on the street or from Bayer across the counter who you can sue if something goes wrong. And again, it deepened my and strengthened my resolve. So I started challenging um, the laws more and more and then strangely found out only within uh, the last six months that just before my grandfather had his stroke, he came out in, in Australian Penthouse magazine, actually. I'd always seen this magazine lying around as a teenager and was interested in it for other reasons <laughs> until recently. I thought, I wonder what he was actually doing in there. And I read it. It was a big article was talking about all these different things. And one of the things he says in there, this is just before he has his stroke, is I've come to realise that um, I'm opposed to laissez-faire decriminalisation, but I'm also mm -hmm. totally opposed to the current prohibition that we have at the moment. The only answer I think we'll come to in the 21st century is the idea of regulating these substances, and that's where we'll get the most satisfaction and control. 
and you tax the hell out of them and, and make sure victims are, are taken care of. So um, recently we've been talking a lot about ice in Australia, um, what you refer to as P. Um, I've been doing a lot of uh, interviews in Australia around um, our work with young people and we've seen a huge reduction in the young people we see across the country, reductions in their, uh, in their um, meth use. So naturally, we were doing lots of interviews around this and the reporters would be asking, so what do you think should happen? I think, and I was saying, well, I think we should be um, trialling new, uh, new ideas, um, you know, perhaps in the same way uh, New Zealand has been trying the regulation of these sub of, of, of substances. Um, we should also be looking to clean pipe exchanges in the same way we did clean needle exchange um, with heroin. We were very successful um, with heroin. Um, in Australia in, in, in reducing that through harm reduction and treatment. And actually police at the time working hand in hand with, with health. Why are we doing the same now? Because a lot of the, the, as Ross would say, the narrative in Australia turned to one where, um, uh, and I think from what Ross tells me, you guys had a similar narrative here. In fact, I was writing about it um, in here where the narrative turned where, someone would use ice the first time and they'd become a, a psychotic zombie and suddenly this drug was was taking over our country and this was the this was the story that was being told over and over again ross told me you went about uh, a guy with a samurai sword here um late to uh, late 2009 10-ish perhaps around then um and um i got really interested in this and i wasn't able to get across all of these ideas, uh, one of the most important ideas, I think, from my point of view, was our King's Cross Injecting Centre and how much that improved that uh, community. Huge reductions in not only overdoses, but also in crime and making that community uh, safe. We used to you walk over um, bodies in the street and needles on our beaches, you couldn't wear, uh, you, you had to wear shoes because there were always needles under the sand. We just don't have that anymore. It's such an ancient idea. So I thought, why are we doing this, the same thing? It's, it, it's, a, it's a different drug, but it's a very similar cohort. And I think we can be um, adopting in, uh, these ideas and bringing them back um, and trying them in new ways. So I decided to write a book about it and that's what this book is, is is challenging the way that we're dealing with this and as I went to research this narrative I realized that the narrative the one that Ross is referring to as well is not one that is unique to Australia and New Zealand in fact you can trace the beginnings of this to Japan in the 1950s when they were the first to experience uh, what you would refer to as an epidemic but is not uh, technically correct, uh, it would, wouldn't, that wouldn't be technically correct, but they refer to it as an epidemic. Um, why? Well, um, um, uh, I'll give you a brief rundown so you don't need to buy the book. Um, but you can, um, buy the book if you, want. you can buy the book if you want to. Thanks, Ross. Have you got a job? <laughs> I need a salesman. Um, the beginnings of ICE happened in Japan over 100 years ago. And there was a, a man named Nago Nagayoshi who first um, uh, was, it was in the time, it was the, the, the end of the samurai and the shogunate and the new emperor, Emperor Meiji, said, we need to strengthen our economy and we need to go out there and we need to become bolder and braver. And they started their pharmaceutical industry. And what they did was they looked at different medicines the Chinese had been using. And one of them, one of the medicines the Chinese had been using was, um, the ephedra plant, uh, really interesting when you put it in, into hot water and make it a tea, when you have a cold, it uh, relaxes your throat, clears up your nose. Well, this is interesting. So they started looking into this and they synthesize ephedrine from it. And they go and they put it out there. It goes wild. Sales are incredible. And then they also later on work out how to make pseudoephedrine as well. So they start doing this originally for actually quite strangely until recently ephedrine was still made from the plant of phaedra from this only a few years later they're looking at i wonder what we do if we, we synthesize 
ephedrine and they they what they synthesized was this thing called methamphetamine what could this be used for they tested it on rats heart rate goes up shelve it and the nazis a few years later when they rise to power go let's look at some different drugs and they're testing in concentration camps they go what's that one the japanese that japanese hadn't patented it they took it and they went let's try this they tested on human beings oh this is good this is really good and they give it to their front line and people's uh, appetites reduced they had clarity of thinking they felt stronger they felt invincible and they also gave it to the Fuhrer himself Hitler was given um, ice on a daily basis given injections of methamphetamine and uh, made him feel pretty good as well and um, I go into detail again in, in the book around this um, but um, around the same time the Japanese look over at the Nazis and they go that's our drug so they get it and then they give it to their cam uh, to the kamikaze pilots and they give it to their people and now at this time England shoots down a plane in southern England the plane comes down there's a dead body in there and there's a pack of tablets what are they they call them uh, mainly panda chocolata tank chocolates is what they called ice let's try this so they go and test it in England oh this is really good we've got to get on this so they give it to their front line they call the Americans you have to try this Americans ran their tests this is unbelievable I was looking at this and I was thinking as I'm researching this I'm thinking this can't be true it is true okay and you can go and research the best academics out there this is absolutely true this is how long this stuff has been around for this is not new all right, so the Americans test it, they test it, and they start picking up the, the negative side effects that quite quickly people can experience a meth psychosis and the rest of it. Doesn't matter, it's still too good. Give it to our troops. They gave it to their troops. At the same time, the front, the Nazis in the front line, uh, uh, they find that ammo's depleted, some have shot each other, shot themselves, done all sorts of things. And the, the top of the Nazi um, structure turn around and the doctors say, we have to reduce this stuff. It is sending our troops crazy. But the others say, but look, we don't have to give them as much food. They don't, they're not relying, they're, the stuff, they're, they're really good fighters. Yeah, but they're actually shooting each other. Okay, so the Nazis, what do they do? They decide to regulate it. They then go, we're not gonna ban it. We're not gonna prohibit it because we know we'll lose control. We'll regulate it. So they start prescribing it to their own army. Um, <clears throat> So um, at this stage, um, uh, this is coming towards the end of the war and um, really looking at it from that point of view, World War II really was the methamphetamine war. It was totally, by the end, driven by methamphetamine. And it's one of those things that we just don't, we don't really hear about uh, today. What happened at the end of that war was um, the Nazis of Germany had effectively regulated. So there were people who were still dependent on, on P um, by the end of the war, but there was a, a limited number of citizens of, of the population. Japan, um, you know, really left in ruins as well, kind of uh, their, their soldiers and their fighters had left and took as many packets as they could with them because they'd become dependent on it. And they'd take them home. And then when they went to work, they'd be using that there. And realising this, the pharmaceutical companies said, we should just turn it into uh, a drug that, that helps people work. And they called this philopon, which comes from, I think it's Greek, philopon, love of labour. <laughs> and they put ads out there. You can still search them on the net. You know, this is great. Mum giving it to their kids and kids <laughs> using it. And, and before too long, uh, the 1950s roll along, and you have a huge, a significant part of the population of Japan dependent on meth. And um, one particular incident, this comes back to this idea, this is where the narrative began, and you can trace this, and I'll trace it in the book. One of the interesting parts that comes back to an incident where a young gang member um, who was supposedly high on meth goes and rapes a schoolgirl. Communities... Uh, you know, after all, the media looks at it and they said, they called to the politicians to ban Philippon. Um, and, of course, the government under the pressure of the media said, yes, that's what we'll do. They ban it. They prohibit it. And what they had then was the um, 
uh, Koreans then start manufacturing and then Chinese start manufacturing and then selling it back to Japan, a huge black market erupts and their dependence deepens on it. And um, the police crack down and in one year they, they arrest tens of thousands of people dependent on it. And then, then the story that's being portrayed over and over in the media at this time is, is, is this is the Japanese murder drug. And this got a, this, this travelled across the seas so much so that Ian Fleming, in writing one of the James Bond novels, Moonraker, writes about the Japanese murder <coughs> drug, Philippon. Turning, uh, uh, turning teenagers into, into psychopathic killers and writes about this in a James Bond novel. And this, this, this narrative starts to, to evolve. And so when you follow this um, through and you see it in TV shows like Breaking Bad and you come to now, you realise this has all been unravelling for some time. Now we stand at it and we look at it today and we say, well, but hold on. It does do this to people. I've just told you stories where this does happen. Yes, it does happen. It absolutely does. It does. You, you do have these stories. Really horrific incidents do occur. But there was one study done in Sydney on the meth market, and they looked at the population of users, and they found that less than a quarter presented with a clinically significant psychotic episode. They found that 11% had been um, hospitalised and they found that most of those who were hospitalised, if they left and they continued to have ongoing symptoms, had a pre-existing mental health issue. So it's something where we look at it and we say, this is a horrible drug, this is a dangerous drug, um, this is something that can affect us. Is it something that's turning everyone into zombies? No. Is it ethical? One, one headline in, in Sydney last year said, Ice Zombie Chews Her Own Toes Off. Now, when it got to that point, I thought, this has actually moved past news. There was no news in that for me. I don't know what I was meant to learn from that. Was I meant to be scared not to take it? Was that the trigger for me not to take it? I wasn't 100% sure. And that's when I realised it had become entertainment. This idea at the same time as we're watching Game of Thrones and The Walking Dead, we were relishing this idea. And I think it could be argued the same for New Zealand, the same for Japan, the same for America, that we relish the idea of the other, coming back to that idea, the, the person who is, you know, uh, who is the criminal, the person who is the drug user, the person who is on ice, and ice gives you that, especially when you have just one violent story. It can set everything off. Now, there is truth in it, but is it sending... So we have currently 2% prevalence users in, in, in Australia at the moment. Is it sending all of those people crazy? Are all of those people dependent? No. The Australian Crime Commission came out saying most of those people we we'll use it once a year. Can we do more to reduce it? Absolutely. Do we need to get this into context? Yes, we do. So I think coming back to this idea of, of, uh, of narratives, um, I think that's a really important point to make is there is a balance with all of this. Um, sorry, something in my eye. New Zealand did something really clever. Um, with with ICE in that the government came out and said we've we've been trying our best to police this. Um, thank you. Um, we're going to try something new. We're going to invest in treatment instead. Now, one part of that, one important part of that, is more money into treatment, right? One that's a really important part of it. Okay, but the other really important aspect of that. And you touched upon it when you said talked about the narrative. Is it starts to send a message to the public instead of one of we're going to crack down and 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 get hard about this and get tough on it. We had a one campaign uh, under John Howard called Tough on Drugs. You know, the message changed. The message then becomes one more of compassion, of understanding. And one of the greatest predictors of actual crime in the community is a perception of crime. 
And in criminology, that's a really important concept. And knowing how the media portrays this actually <coughs> changes how crime happens in the community. It's a really important, not very often discussed point. So I think that was one of the major things as part of it as well. One was the funding, but the other part was changing the attitude. And from that, we actually looked at what you guys are doing here and mm -hmm. we advised our Prime Minister to follow the same path, which is we don't think you should um, reduce law enforcement necessarily, <coughs> but treatment does need to come up to play an equal part and the message needs to change. One of the most important things that we did with heroin was health work together with police. And in Australia, unfortunately, over the last 10 years, we've had that separation and a competition with police saying, you know, no, we know the way to do this and health saying, no, we know the way to do this. The only way is together. And I was saying to some senior police in Australia recently, as we move towards decriminalisation, which is absolutely where we're headed, and to some extent we have that across the country, it's just it's police uh, at a lower level get to have the discretion whether they are going to enforce something or not. As we move towards decriminalisation, I said to the police, there will not be a reduction of what police do. There will be an expansion and a shifting. The paradigm will move from one of cracking down and being tough on drugs to moving to helping people. As I was saying to Virginia before, who wants to, have you ever met anyone who wants to decriminalise assault or decriminalise murder? No one wants to do that. But right now we have a conflation when something occurs, like the samurai incident, where we have one episode, we also know there's a mental health issue there, and there's a drug issue. And we treat it all and we say, it's peak, let's crack down on that. So the message and changing those things are really important. So you guys have absolutely led the way and then helped us. We changed that and we had a huge shift in that. The, the government didn't come out as much uh, publicly on that and they kind of buried it knowing that people would be scared of this idea that law enforcement was taking a, a sidekick role with, with, with treatment. But that narrative changed. And I think that's a, that, that was something we really learned from you guys. And then the other thing too is then moving towards regulation. So I've started saying that with our politicians, that if they want to look to the future, um, we look to you guys. And that upsets a lot of people, especially when we start talking about rugby. Um, and one of my good friends is David Pocock, so I generally just zip it when I'm around him. Um, but it's true. I really do believe you guys uh, are leaders in this. And, um, and I thank you very much for it. And we hope to learn a lot more from you coming into the future. Thank you. Do you want to Australian week. Uh, it's the air can't handle the New Zealand fresh air. <laughs> Thanks, Max. Uh, my pleasure now to, to welcome um, Detective Superintendent Virginia Labar. Um, she joined, you sit down for a second. No, you will stand here. You, you can stand. I'm going to say words, nice okay. words about you first. Virginia joined the police in 1991. Uh, prior to that, um, and I think this is probably an important part to Virginia's career, prior to police, she was a secondary school teacher. Um, and I think it's helped inform some of her some of her thinking. Uh, she was a frontline police officer and then moved to the criminal investigations branch where she was for for 23 years. She's received a long service staff of 21 years in the service, decent length of time. She's worked with the Pacific Chiefs of Police. She's worked uh, on secondment to the Australian Federal Police. Uh, the first woman to be appointed the national manager for, for organised crime, and so she heads the uh, Ofcans, the Organised and Financial Crime uh, Agency. Outside of the police, uh, she runs and runs, no, cycles. And cycles and cycles and cycles. She's a long distance cyclist. She travels the world and, uh, and, and, and cycles a lot. Um, we work very closely with Virginia, and, and to me, she embodies uh, the police's new prevention first strategy. Uh, Virginia was on the board. She gets us. She was on the board of the Alcohol and Drug Helpline. 
so she has a real strong sense around uh, treatment, help seeking, um, the, probably the connection, you know, the, the fact that there needs to be a, a balanced approach. She is not just a law enforcement as number one, and in fact she's probably a voice inside police to, to, to argue quite strongly for either a balanced approach or even a, a tipping the balance towards um, towards help. Um, so uh, please again join me in welcoming Virginia. Thank you. Um, I might uh, just uh, hand those out there for you to grab one if you just have not quite enough to go around. Um, thank you for the uh, very welcoming introduction and uh, good afternoon to you all. Um, one thing I can say is that everyone that's here in this room is here and we've got something in common and that's that we care. Uh, we care about making a difference in our community. And um, oh, I'll just go on to the next slide, thank you. <coughs> and importantly, I've just handed around the business model of the New Zealand Police. And you'll see um, our mission is to be the safest country in the world and to contribute to that. At the moment, New Zealand is the fourth safest country in the world. And um, it's something that um, I think that we all can be very proud of. And together, uh, we care to make it number one. Um, Matt, thanks. Uh, thank you very much for your very he's run away now. Um, very interesting um, past history, and I think that's one thing that I go back and reflect. It's it's good to look back and see where, how we've got to where we are now, and it's um, always fascinating. Also, um, you know, to think that Aboriginals were considered to be animals in the 1950s. I mean, I just that just flabbergasted me. That's something I didn't know. Um, so thank you for sharing that um, really <coughs> amazing, um, your journey effectively. And I think importantly, you do recognise that um, there's many countries around the world that can learn a lot from New Zealand. And unfortunately, we often look at ourselves and we look out <coughs> to everyone else to try and learn from them. And um, I still so often think we're such a privileged um, country with four and a half million people and we should hold on very tightly to what we have and just keep looking at ourselves and keep improving and um, and be leading the way. So um, it was it's really nice, Matt, that you recognise that in us. Um, so yes, um, I am uh, the National Manager of Organised Crime for the New Zealand Police. Sounds like I organise it, but I don't. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've just um, ticked over 25 years in the New Zealand Police, which seems to have just passed like in a flash. And um, also it's this week, which Eugene uh, just reminded me of sitting there and I'm wearing this badge here with pride that it's 75 years that New Zealand uh, women have been in the police in New Zealand. However, interesting, going back to history, because the Australians have had women in the police for 100 years. So there's something we lag behind a little bit there. So I do wear that badge proudly and on um, Monday there's a march to Parliament to celebrate that event of women being in um, policing for 75 years. And uh, I am the first um, detective superintendent um, in the history of New Zealand and New Zealand Police. So, and um, that is a privilege that I've, all it shows is that it can be done and I've opened the door for other people to demonstrate it's doable. So um, I am proud of um, being here and standing in front of you today in that position. Um, I, during my career and um, time in the police, I've investigated and I have been the majority of my time as a detective, uh, as an investigator, so I say a problem solver. And um, I've been involved in some of the most horrendous crimes of investigating them and holding people to be accountable. And that's for murder, very serious assaults. I've worked in the organised crime arena for a long time. Um, <clears throat> And I think for where I've learned in my career, it's the victims, it's the people, the harm that it causes. It's all very well arresting and prosecuting people and putting them into prison. But some of that doesn't make anything better. Well, in fact, it doesn't. I don't see from my experience that, you know, you certainly hold people to be accountable, but it still um, weighs very heavily to me to deal with the families in particular of homicide victims. Um, and uh, whatever happens, it never changes. It never brings those family members back. 
So it is, um, when I look at our business model, which you have in front of you, I think each of you, um, or not all of you, but um, about our strategy in the New Zealand place, it is, our mission is to be the safest country in the world. And um, our purpose is to have a be safe, um, feel safe community. And it's something that um, each New Zealand police officer strives to um, create and be involved with. And then I go to other organisations like the Drug um, Foundation uh, and look at this uh, New Zealand free from drug harm. Not free from drugs, but drug harm. And the mission statement, be the catalyst for people, their communities, service providers and policy makers to take action that prevents drug harm. And you'll notice in... Um, down here in the bottom of the goals for the New Zealand Police, um, our goals is to re reduce the social harm in our communities. So we've got clear linkages, we've got connections, we've got the same types of values, working towards the same things, coming from slightly different aspects, but we all have got the same mission and purpose. I find that extremely encouraging, that we are all starting to identify that and working together. Prevention first is without a doubt our key strategy in the New Zealand Police. It um, actually goes back to the, how policing originated from Pelion principles, where when police were um, first created, it was all about um, your police officers would never be measured on how many arrests they met, would make it how little or how less the um, crime was in the community. And, uh, you know, I look at really in my... I think it's still a short career, really, 25 years in the place. There's a lot of people who've done a lot more time than me. Um, that um, I did used to keep a list of how many people are arrested, and um, that was a measure uh, of how good you were as a police officer. And um, so it's it's good and encouraging that we now, and we've grown and learned as a community, that um, it is about prevention and, and ensuring that we lessen the or decrease the harm in the community. We have fewer victims um, so that people can strive and grow in this country. Uh, so I believe that um, the the actual business plan of the New Zealand Place is, is actually quite visionary. It's I actually did some, an interview panel the other day for some staff um, for a promotion and, um, and I hear our people talk in our organisation and they all go, wow, it's so good to have this. We know what we're here for and it's all in one place. And I think so many of us, like many of you, of where you're working every day, you know, what's my mission? What am I here for? What am I doing? And it's very encouraging. So, um, of course, we need to get over the stereotypes of what we see and believe. And um, I think for myself, I, because <clears throat> I haven't worn a uniform very, very much of my career, as soon as I put my uniform on and if I walked in here in my uniform, one of my colleagues down there in his uniform, <coughs> sorry, people do look at you differently and actually um, treat you differently. And, and that's something that we all have to understand. Um, it's, um, I know Eugene recently came to a, a, a organised con crime conference for us and I think we both, because we were both a little bit different, um, we were you know, a little bit isolated in the corner and you sort of, you know, it's, it's quite uh, interesting. So, but it's all those challenges for each and every one of us. And I, and I do feel that I can put on my uniform and go somewhere or introduce myself as a police officer and suddenly the <laughs> people depart. And um, <laughs> I always feel a little bit sad about that because I always think oh, I'm actually a good person and trying to do the right thing. So anyway, look, we'll move on. Um, so our business plan, I think it's worthy of you all seeing that. Um, could anyone just tell me if they realised or knew that Prevention First was this key strategy of New Zealand Place? You did, yeah. Not too many. Mm. So um, I hope that's something for you to take away and, and understand. I'm happy to take any questions at the end. I'll um, just go to the next slide. Thank you. So talking about methamphetamine, well, it's um, interesting, isn't it? I don't know if you can all see that slide. So from 2014, um, so all of 2014, all of 2015, and to, to May 2016, um, we, as we, uh, our police, my police, our colleagues and customs, we um, took out 516 kilos of methamphetamine out of the community. And 2,128 kilos of um, pseudo ephedrine. That was till May. And then after May, well, we got 200 kilos in one shipment of ephedrine. 
and then we got about 500 kilos of methamphetamine so it just blew all those numbers out and you just stand here and go well what does this mean <clears throat> we've done a we've done a heck of a lot of law enforcement i mean we have arrested a lot of dealers we've arrested a lot of people smuggling these commodities into our country um, we've taken a lot of assets of people who've been making money out of dealing um, this drug which is illegal at this time and um, in the clandestine labs that we have come across um, they're really interesting they are still there within and around New Zealand with the manufacturer of methamphetamine and what's the really disheartening thing each one of those red um, people are children the children found in the labs that are exposed to those chemicals and um, I think that is the real harm factor there with those really dangerous chemicals the fumes um, and those young children and their young lives and in, involved in that environment very often firearms obviously police coming through the doors of the exposure and what that means for them for their future and that's something that we are now addressing with I'd have to say you know years ago when um, 20 years ago when I first started in the police we might have gone and dealt with these clan labs and these children and really didn't give them this a second look and say oh someone at some other agency will pick that up now we have with our connections and our collaboration with our other partner agencies we take that very seriously and and establish a contact and have um, capabilities to assist with those children getting them some better life experiences or some other opportunities away from that sort of type of life um, just going into the methamphetamine, what we're seeing in New Zealand at the moment, that the large majority of <clears throat> the methamphetamine is coming from um, China, Asia, um, Hong Kong, uh, a little bit more from Mexico, uh, and then we've seen Canada and Thailand. So uh, the distribution networks. So I'll just go on to the next slide and talk a little bit about that. So what we look at in relation to methamphetamine, we're looking at supply, the demand and the harm. So there's three pillars there. The supply, um, it, you know, the large majority of the methamphetamine that's coming into this country is from offshore and it involves uh, large and expensive organised crime um, networks. And I'm talking about international networks who effectively in China make methamphetamine very, very cheaply. Um, and it's described to me that there's mountains of methamphetamine sitting to be distributed around the world from China. And, um, and these people will take risks and utilise different technologies and different transportation method, methods to feed in uh, the, that commodity into a community wherever they want to around the world and effectively make a lot of money offshore. Um, <clears throat> so here I've just drawn like the world and uh, the main port and uh, where we see is the distribution comes into is into Auckland and you'll see in the last few um, months um, how much uh, we have taken out at the border um, it is coming in because there's a demand here for it uh, and or um, it could possibly be a transshipment point through to Australia for that commodity I have no doubt although we've taken um, kilos away out of the border in the last few weeks <clears throat> I've no doubt we'll have you'll hear of hundreds of more kilos being seized at the border in the next six months because it just keeps coming um, the the international network around the distribution of um, an illicit commodities such as this is very well organized and uh, they're very well networked and uh, they're, make, they're making a lot of money so when we're looking around this and around law enforcement uh, we um, we believe that we need to network um, a network to combat a network and then unfortunately because of um, the money that's involved in uh, involved in methamphetamine and people have this desire to become wealthy it also involves a lot of violence uh, firearms and uh, other wider victims who, who um, end up being involved in that so um, once the commodity comes into this country uh, again it requires a network for distribution 
and what we see that there is a, a number of different gangs, uh, gang members that are involved in the distribution of methamphetamine throughout the country. Uh, I, we, by no means at all do I um, say that every single gang member is involved in that, but uh, there is a, a majority, well not a majority, a number that are, and you know it makes sense. You need your contacts and your connections to be able to have a distribution network. And that's what uh, we are seeing here in New Zealand. The other, the other um, very sad component to all of this that there are, when I talk about uh, vulnerabilities and people that unwittingly become involved and get exploited, people that become um, mules in the situation of the distribution who um, get sucked in by um, organised crime groups to say, hey, look, can you go offshore? Um, we'll give you. $10,000 and you bring her back a couple of suitcases and they're full of methamphetamine and they're just really collateral damage for um, high-end criminal networks. Um, the same happens within New Zealand, often young females become involved with transshipment of um, methamphetamine through the, this country and um, and are just being util um, utilised and used um, for other people's um, transshipments or networking and ultimately make the money. Those aren't the people that are making money. There is a, a few that may make some money <coughs> out of methamphetamine. Um, let's move on to the next slide, please. So um, my own personal view, it's not a war against methamphetamine. It's um, because we go to war against an enemy and I don't think what we're looking here is the enemy. It's a very complex problem. Uh, we often try to um, simplify it, but it is complex because we've got a lot of people involved and it means a lot of um, different things for different people. One of the things that New Zealand, and I don't know, Mark, if uh, you're across this, but um, in 2014, New Zealand government, um, there's a cabinet paper that described the gang action plan, and the gang action plan is around reducing harm in the community. It's not about removing gangs out of New Zealand society. It's about um, <coughs> decreasing the crime that uh, gang people that are affiliated with gangs uh, may be committing and uh, to reduce the harm, the ongoing harm of those crimes that are committed. And there was a significant amount of work done um, between the agencies to collect the data of what harm meant. And we're basically looking at violence and child abuse and the cost to our community around that. And don't worry, there is the the drug and alcohol problem behind that. And it was quite significant. So rather than just trying to say, oh, it's a family violence, there's robberies, and that, this was looking at some people. And um, it, it uh, you know, we do see uh, these, uh, the network of gangs being involved in a large amount of crime. And as a community, it's like, how do we shift that crime behaviour? So the, um, the proposal around the gang action plan was to look at four pillars. So it wasn't just going to be about police and task force and just enforcement and go and arrest them all. Um, you know, what, what, what were the task force going to be? We needed some more information. I have to say the, the gang intelligence centre sounded like it's a big spying unit, but it's not. Um, but what did that mean? There was um, a legislative toolbox that was put in there and social support. So this came my way to um, oversee with in the place with the other government agencies. When I talk about this, I'm also talking about rep when I'm, I'm representing um, health, education, MSD, corrections, immigration. The, all the government agencies are in on this, uh, the gang action plan, reducing harm. So the Gang Intelligence Centre has been um, set up and it's effectively to have information around the people of where are the opportunities to make a difference and where are the opportunities that we can look out and into the, each social group or with the assistance of the Drug Foundation to share that, um, the possibilities. And rather than information sitting in one agency and someone knowing and not doing anything about it, how can we collaborate? And it's like with you know our mission, we can only be good together as a team to make a difference. And a team needs to be made up of all sorts of people. So um, that that um, centre is well established now, and it is based in the police. And um, we um, 
working together with all the agencies to look at the opportunities and to understand. It's very easy to look at each other and think you understand people. And uh, I think, as Matt said, it's getting that understanding to then discover where you can have implementation strategies. The task forces, um, yeah, the lot they are enforcement, and they are looking at addressing the issues around the, the border and how much of the commodities coming in. Um, when we look at methamphetamine, uh, the the crimes that are being committed, and where we can um, have strategies around bringing in law enforcement and holding people to be account. Uh, but then what are the opportunities after that? Legislative changes. Um, look, the more we go and look at things, there's legislation is quite good in New Zealand around different things that we can do. Things can be improved or there could be some changes and that's really being informed from some of the information here. So rather than thinking it's a good idea, let's go back to some evidence and some science as to whether it's not or um, is it going to be successful, is it going to make a difference? And then look, the big component here is social support. That without social support and law enforcement working together and legislation, then it's very disjointed. And we're all trying to do things, but not collectively making having any impact. So to me, again, a very encouraging piece of um, an action plan. We've already seen the meth action plan. We're looking at a, a refresh in the next period of time, which I think is timely. Uh, this, this has um, effectively been operational since uh, the end of last year and we're looking at strategies as a 25 year strategy as to what this means and it's about reducing the harm. It's not about removing gangs out of our society. And uh, as, as said before, the transnational organised crime groups and at this time it's around methamphetamine are always looking for vulnerabilities in communities and we do see that there are uh, different groups in our communities that are being utilised by organised criminal networks offshore. That's next slide, please. Um, I think Ross touched on it earlier. Um, what we see from our in our policing um, from our police staff is that uh, you know there is methamphetamine. People are using our perception of the staff going out and everyday activities. Um, there's all sorts of people and places that we find um, people utilising or using methamphetamine. And um, I don't think we could ever say there's a particular person or type. One of the things that's really difficult for me standing here is going, because methamphetamine is illegal and it's like anything that's a crime, uh, family violence, how do you understand a problem when people don't want to talk about it? And that's quite a challenge. So. Um, the more that we can understand and get from other organisations and work collectively around that, the problem is where we can intervene together. And we endeavour as a police organisation to continue to understand that because, as I said, our strategy is prevention first. And anyone that has been in the police for a period of time does know that I see then um, arrests that I made when I was a younger policewoman, they are now children. Who are perhaps committing crime and I actually feel like I've been a bit of a failure because I thought I was doing the right thing and you know held someone to be accountable and that would matter and count I mean often it does and I'm using this perhaps some small examples but you know um, just that one sort of thing that hasn't changed has an impact on me and I, I am very motivated around that um, when I say a network, uh, internationally a network to combat the methamphetamine coming into this country, we are working with our international partners in that, in that space, but it does also mean we need a strong network within our countries. And that's why I value um, Ross's support and the communication we have, because I know that if we don't have that and don't share the, our ideas, then we actually can't collectively work and make any difference. Um, I have a saying, you know, small drops of water erode granite. So I know sometimes it feels like you're doing a small piece of work. But truly have the belief that everything that you do will have an impact down the track. And I guess I liken that to that I would assume most people now these days um, do recycling. And uh, if you stopped, you go, well, would it make a difference? Probably not to the bigger picture. <coughs> But if a whole lot of people stop doing that, it will make a difference. So collectively, 
you know, small drops of water erode granite and together we might become a fountain or a big, you know, so river um, making a difference. So thank you for your support. Thank you for listening to me and uh, look, keep up all your good work. And um, if anyone has anything that you have to offer from the, what we've heard and um, any ideas and suggestions for me, I'm welcome to hear those. Thank you. Thanks, Virginia. We've got a bit of